I recently made a presentation about Japanese woodblock printmaking and my general process. I wanted to use this opportunity to give an overview about the subject and how the prints are made. I'll call it a conclusion or a summary to my woodblock printmaking tutorial series. However, if you haven't seen that yet, make sure to watch this video before you check it out. To start, I'll explain what Japanese printmaking is, then I'll discuss my process and how I make prints, and finally, I'll talk a little bit about my thoughts and ongoing learnings on the subject. To start, I want to talk more generally about what a relief print is. The goal of any printmaking is to reproduce images with unique qualities. That means something you can't normally achieve with something like a inkjet or laser printer. Relief printmaking involves cutting, carving, or etching a printing surface. And it's reductive, meaning you carve away the unneeded space and leave the remaining raised design. You can see the diagram I illustrated below that demonstrates this concept. All the raised areas have pigment which ultimately transfers to the paper. So what makes Japanese woodblock printmaking, or moku hanga, unique? Firstly, the printing service is always wood. Traditionally, that would be a Japanese cherry wood. However, in modern moku hanga, there's many different types of wood that are used. Secondly, water-based pigments are always used. That means they're transparent and they can layer on top of each other, rather than just be completely opaque. Finally, brushes are used to spread the pigment over the wood surface. That means that there will be pigment all over the block, both on the raised and lowered surfaces, as opposed to other forms of printmaking where a tool such as a brayer is used. Now we'll talk through my printmaking process. It always begins with designing the print. First, I'll start off by just doing some sketching, generally a notebook or on some printer paper, and I'll just do my simple line drawing, which is really the key, it's the first step. Next, I'll add some colors to the drawing, and I'll make sure to plan this out carefully, because each color will represent a separate layer, meaning a separate carved block. However, the black and white line drawing is what we'll need for the first step. Now, we need to transfer that drawing to a woodblock. The first step is to carve what are called registration marks into the block. This is a method of aligning paper onto a block. It enables consistent print alignment, which is very important in Mokuhanga. That's what allows us to layer many different colors and line them all up. Now that the registration marks have been carved, we can complete the transfer. The first step is to spread rice paste over the wood block. This acts as a mild glue. Next, align the drawing into the registration marks very carefully, and glue the paper down onto the block. Importantly, the paper has to be face down, meaning the design is laying directly onto the wood. Next, we'll gently peel the backside of the paper off, which reveals the inverted image. This is what the block looks like right after the transfer. The next step in the process is to carve the first block. However, before I show some images of that, I want to talk a little bit about the basics. There's three tools that are mainly used in this process. A knife, u-gouge, and a bull nose chisel. You'll see on the right that I've outlined the major steps of carving. I reproduced a diagram from David Bull's website for this purpose. I'll leave his link in the description because he has so much useful information posted online. The first step is to outline the design with the knife. Next, we scoop out the empty areas with a u-gouge. And finally, we clean up the space between the knife lines and those empty spaces with a bull nose chisel. Here are some images from carving that first block. This one is always called the key block and it represents those black lines, the outlines of the image. So again, you're carving away the empty spaces and leaving those black lines remaining intact. Once the key block has been carved, we need to take several impressions of it in order to allow us to carve those color blocks. 
That's another reason it's called the key block. It's, it's the key to all of the rest of the blocks. So the first step is to clean any excess paper off of that key block because there still is probably some remaining glue and paper from the transfer. Um, so once we've done that, we brush Sumi ink onto the block. This is just a really dark black pigment and we'll spread it evenly in circular motions with our brushes. Next, we align paper just like we did in the registration marks earlier and lay it onto the blocks. Then we'll use a tool called a Baron to apply pressure and transfer the image into the paper. We need to take more impressions than we have color blocks planned because it's always good to have a few backups. Now that the impressions have been taken from the key block, we'll use those to create the color separations. To do this, we'll highlight each individual planned color separately on each impression. For example, maybe the blue region of the print is highlighted alone by itself on a single impression. Now it's time to transfer all of the color separations we've made onto separate wood blocks. We'll do this using the same exact method that we used for the key box, meaning we'll start by carving the registration marks and then glue them face down within that alignment method. This means that in the end, all the blocks will line up perfectly together. And when we print the final image, all the different color layers will be perfectly aligned. Now the color separations have all been transferred to their respective block and it's time to carve again. We'll approach this in the same manner as the key block. Carve away the undesired regions and leave remaining the highlighted regions in this case. This is the full block set for one print after I've finished carving and cleaning each individual one. Now it's all ready for printing. The first prints I make are always practice prints where I'm dialing in the colors and the techniques for that particular block set. The printing process in general is pretty complicated, so I'll give an overview here of kind of the order of operations. The first aspect that I'll mention is that the paper needs to be moistened throughout the process, so you need some way to retain water while you're going. However, the first step is to apply pigment to the block in addition to water and rice paste, which will mix together as you brush. Next, you'll place a sheet of paper into the registration marks and lay it down on the surface. Then you'll use your Baron to apply pressure, making small circular motions. Then you'll take that sheet off the block and put it in the pile of finished prints. You'll go through all of your blank sheets until every single one is printed and then you'll start the next color. You'll continue this process until all the blocks have been printed, meaning that you've finished every single print in the set. Here are some images I took throughout the printing process. On the left, you'll see I have a method of adding and retaining moisture. In the middle, you'll see some shots during the pigment application. And then finally, you'll see some shots during and after all of the printing. After several rounds of printing, I'm ready to make a final edition of prints. One aspect about this process and printmaking in general is that consistency is key. To help with this, I always take notes during my process, both in the practice and the final runs, so that I can always go back and make repeatable prints in the future. Here is an example of the most complex print I ever made. On the right, you can see the type of notes that I would generally take, and in this case, I had many pages of notes for just the practice prints. Japanese printmaking has been a very rewarding hobby for me, and I've learned a lot throughout the process. First, I've learned that sometimes you have to find creative solutions to overcome your challenges. In this hobby, there's a lot of very traditional tools and techniques, and sometimes they can be hard to access. In this case, you need to use what you have and find creative solutions to get around that. Also, I've learned that it's sometimes good to seek wisdom and help from others. There's a lot of people in this community who are super friendly and helpful, and this has really helped speed up my learning process. 
Finally, I only continue to realize how many aspects there are to this hobby and how much there is to learn. That's something that I really love about Moku Hanga. Thank you so much for watching, and if you found this presentation interesting, be sure to check out my in-depth tutorial below.